Um, yes, maybe just to start. Um, mm -hmm. I have a, well a naive question about the what is this mi ministry, digital affairs? For mm -hmm. us, it's, it sounds a bit strange. So mm -hmm. maybe you can just explain what uh, what there is behind this uh, expression of digital affairs. Sure. So um, the the numeric right yes. the digital um, touches many areas, uh, and in the past three years. Uh, we countered the pandemic uh, without a single day of lockdown, uh, partly thanks to the close collaboration of digital related agencies in many ministries, among which, for example, uh, for open data uh, in the National Development Council, uh, for platform economy in the Ministry of Economic Affairs, for the broadband as human rights, uh, 4G and 5G deployments in the National Communication Commission, for the Department of Cybersecurity to safeguard us against the cyber attacks, and many more. Mm -hmm. um, but we were able to work closely together, even on a daily basis, because there was a Central Epidemic Command Center, or CECC. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, nowadays we're post-pandemic, or at least postponed pandemic, mm -hmm. until the next uh, Greek letter. Uh, and so <laughs> uh, we, we are now seeing that in many other areas that needs this coordinated response to emergent threats, such as earthquakes, mm -hmm. natural or human-made earthquakes. Uh, and so, <laughs> we'll <be coming> <laughs> yeah. uh, and so uh, we look at all these agencies that we work closely together as a digital minister at large for the past six years, and just bring them all together into a ministry. Okay. Uh, so each of their original ministries lost a team uh, agency. Okay. Uh, and then together is a new ministry. But there is no uh, military issue in mm -hmm. the ministry. Uh, it's all civilian, uh, so we plan for all hazards, okay. right? So all hazards means uh, typhoons, earthquakes, very large earthquake that destroys submarine cables, mm -hmm. something that actually happens, mm -hmm. uh, like an uh, actual natural earthquake, mm -hmm. and a natural earthquake that destroys even more cables. Okay, <laughs> we, we will talk about it. Um, coming from the, mm -hmm. the threat and the, the scale mm -hmm. of the threat, how would you um, mm -hmm. describe the, the, the scale? And the reality of the mm -hmm. cyber security, mm -hmm. the propaganda, all mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. warfare, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. threats that uh, Taiwan faces today. Mm -hmm. I would say we're on the front line facing authoritarian expansionism. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the reality is that we're subject to more than our fair share of cyber attacks. And that's because uh, if some uh, tactic gains traction uh, here, uh, it's like a proving ground. Uh, there's a good chance of success in other parts of the world because our cyber defense is battle tested. Our upgrades um, shields uh, not just the public sector information, but also the uh, intelligence uh, from the um, industrial sectors, such mm -hmm. as the TSMC's blueprints and so on. And these are very high value uh, targets for industry espionage uh, as well. Uh, and so the price uh, is high uh, and the defense battle tested. Uh, and so there is a lot of um, uh, attention mm -hmm. in trying to exploiting the system uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, and also the other thing I would also mention uh, is that there's this idea of cognitive uh, warfare or mm -hmm. hybrid warfare. Uh, the idea is you combine a cyber attack mm -hmm. uh, with a propaganda campaign. Okay. One example. Um, so, early August, uh, when the U.S. Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, uh, immediately afterwards, uh, there was live fire drills, of course, mm -hmm. but also cyber attacks. Uh, we recorded unprecedented 23-fold uh, uh, volume in distributed denial of service bots from abroad, mm -hmm. trying to uh, keep the line busy uh, to disrupt the service for the uh, presidential office website, Ministry of uh, National Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and other ministries. And concretely, what were the consequences of this? Uh, yeah, concept? so people could not connect to those websites for a few hours. But during those few hours, the propaganda says the black hat hackers have successfully conquered, taken over mm. the ministries. Mm. Uh, and not the same, right? Uh, but it's uh, difficult to check the official sources when the websites are down. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of that, this uh, hybrid cognitive um, propaganda, uh, we, uh, the ministry, although we will start operation only at the end of August, we publish our website uh, on the same hour as mm -hmm. the live fire drill. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we say uh, to the journalists, uh, we welcome everyone to attack our website 
to try to take us down. Uh, and because we are uh, tied to the backbone of not just Web 2, but Web 3, uh, we choose the same IPFS system as the board, a yacht club, you know, the NFT crypto <coughs> people. So if you take our website down, you also take down all the NFTs. Uh, and so it, it's interesting because it, uh, it made people realize it's not the same as keeping a line busy and taking over a website. Mm -hmm. So it's a clarification. But more importantly, we get many supporters from all over the world, more than 200,000 computers. They can all voluntarily uh, donate their hard drive to back up uh, our website. So we got interest from protocol labs from all across the world saying that they they want to come to defend uh, Taiwan with the press of the key uh, to open our website. But the, the, the idea is to work uh, with the people mm -hmm. and not only... I just for the people. Yes. For, that's it? Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh, concretely mm -hmm. speaking, what, what does it mean? Yeah, so people can voluntarily uh, yes. join our cause. As I mentioned, donating their uh, spare hard drives and mm -hmm. connectivity and so on, uh, or participate voluntarily uh, in fact checking. In Taiwan, there is a strong community mm -hmm. called Colfax uh, from the Cup Zero, and anyone who's not a professional journalist can nevertheless inform mm -hmm. the professional journalists uh, by reporting on end to end encrypted channels uh, what is uh, the most trending uh, disinformation campaign at the moment. So we don't run uh, the platform, of course, it's in the civil society, just like we don't uh, fund the journalists and directly, uh, we're not uh, like that, uh, <laughs> we're not, but, we're not. Uh, but uh, we hold uh, talks. So the platforms like Google, Facebook and so on, we hold talks so that they can fairly compensate because we don't have the uh, near neighboring rights uh, of copyrights yeah. uh, mm -hmm. like in, in France. Uh, so uh, we need to figure out some other way for the collective in negotiation. So the fair share of advertisement revenue and so on from Google and Facebook, uh, especially Google because Google use search engine and the search engine use the journalistic uh, reports which are cannot be you know copyrighted in Taiwan. Uh, and so it's not very fair. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we're talking to uh, make sure that the Google uh, pays uh, uh, equal fund either directly or through digital transformation efforts and so on mm -hmm. uh, in kind uh, sponsorship and the first talk will start uh, I think end of this month uh, so our role is to support journalism mm -hmm. and civic journalism without any control of journalism yeah. would you say that war has already started mm -hmm. uh, online in, online online in the cyberspace uh, yeah I, I think we we talk about hazards uh, because we're the civilian ministry, you see. <laughs> and, and, and all hazards, uh, of course, need resilience. And so our cornerstone value is called resilience for all. Yes. Um, and uh, irrespective of whether the hazards are caused uh, by Mother Nature or human beings and so on, uh, the end result is the same, right? It's the service getting disrupted, people confused, uh, anxious. Uh, lots of fear and so on. Mm -hmm. And to combat that, uh, we need broadband as human rights, consistent communication, especially provided to journalists. Mm -hmm. but, uh, resilience is uh, a word that means uh, everything and maybe at the same time nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, concretely speaking, mm -hmm. uh, I guess you mentioned the di digital resilience. What do you put in that expression, digital sure. resilience? Sure. So, um, as you uh, correctly observe, uh, you always need an adjective before resilience for it to mean uh, anything, right? So, for example, uh, Taiwan does suffer a lot from earthquakes. Uh, at any given day, there's three failed earthquakes on average somewhere in Taiwan. Uh, around the turn of the century, uh, we suffer a really large, a huge uh, earthquake uh, because we're at the boundary of the two tectonic uh, plates. Mm. Uh, and after that, the word resilience gained traction because not just the building uh, like Taipei 101 <laughs> need to be built uh, with earthquakes in mind, but also city planning, urban planning and everything need to plan with the likes of that earthquake, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and of course the Japanese are even larger uh, with tsunami and, and so on, uh, reinforced uh, that word. So in Taiwan, uh, resilience means a collaborative effort across a diverse uh, discipline, backgrounds, people and so on to plan not just for future hazards, but learning from the past hazards to strengthen ourselves against. Um, and in the digital realm, it means uh, learning from the cyber attacks that I have just uh, mentioned 
and build uh, the defense mechanisms so that not only we can uh, withstand that sort of attack, but also upgrade our cybersecurity capabilities, our awareness, adopting new architectures like the zero trust architecture, refactoring uh, our existing uh, digital services to uh, be more pluralistic in our sources. Because usually the cyber attacks attack the weakest link. And that weakest link uh, is usually uh, like a single point of failure. You take it down, it's all down, right? Mm -hmm. So the IPFS or Web3 basically means uh, anyone, a plural um, amount of sources can help us backing up. It's very difficult to take all the 200,000 distributed computers down around the world at the same time. So similarly, uh, we must rely not just on submarine cables, but also satellites and many other ways. Yeah, okay, we we'll talk about it. Uh -huh. um, would you say that cyber attacks and, and, and attacks on the online and internet and telecommunications mm. system infrastructure are um, the biggest threat for, mm. uh, for mm. Taiwan? Mm. Especially they are mm. the forthcoming election at the end of next week. Oh yeah, uh, is it something uh. that uh, worried you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, disrupting the fair elections mm. uh, would be the kind of ultimate uh, prize for the attackers, mm -hmm. right? Because fair elections are the hallmarks uh, of a vibrant uh, democracy. And those seeking to interfere the process, I think it's not about taking down a party, taking down a candidate or supporting a party or something like that. No, they seek to undermine people's faith in the democracy process itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so Taiwan and all the other partnering democracies, uh, we are basically joined in a mission uh, to stand together and safeguarding the foundation of this free and open process. Uh, and so like online polarization, um, hate, uh, mm. um, I think during the US House Speaker Pelosi's visit, uh, even the uh, advertisement bulletin board system outside of the Taiwan rail station uh, was hijacked to display hate messages. Mm. Uh, and obviously, this is not about supporting a candidate or a party, mm. but rather to intimidate people so that they would uh, fear to participate in the democratic process mm. or talking to other democratic allies. But, uh, what is this, just to understand, what is yeah. the scale of, the, of these attacks? It yeah. seems to be yeah. daily. Is yeah, millions, a millions a day. Right? Millions a day. But most are stopped. Just like uh, most earthquakes, you don't feel it, right? It's small, yeah. but it's low yeah. on the seismic scale. Uh, so um, I think the numbers, I think you, last year it was about 5 million a day, uh, more than twice uh, than the pre preceding year. So it's growing. And what, do, you, do you know where, what is the origin, where they come from? We know it comes from abroad because Taiwan's uh, unique topology, right? Mm. It's either domestic or it travels through submarine cables. Mm. Now, of course, the other end of submarine cable, there, there may be botnets. Uh, those may be computer that was taken over. Okay. Uh, so the origin of that point doesn't matter. Maybe there's like 17 hops uh, before, yeah, yeah, before it mounts the attack. But we know it's not domestic. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only thing you, you can say. Yes, um, from okay. abroad. <laughs> <laughs> it's large. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel, uh, faced to these uh, millions of attacks, do you feel mm -hmm. the, the kind of urgency? Mm -hmm. What is the, yes, the, the urgency and mm -hmm. danger of the moment right now? I mean, after, after the drills, after the, after the drills, the, even after the, mm -hmm. the 20th Congress of the oh, yeah. Communist Party mm -hmm. in China, mm -hmm. what is the urgency? Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel it? Yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned, um, the, following the, <coughs> the drill, um, there's a renewed interest in looking at this hybrid form. Mm -hmm. Previously, people think of cyber attack as cyber attack, like industrial espionage and so on. Uh, propaganda as propaganda, uh, disinformation campaign as disinformation campaign, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, these were highly coordinated uh, mm -hmm. during August. Uh, and then, so we're now planning uh, for this kind of uh, combined hazards, right? Mm -hmm. Earthquake and tsunami. <laughs> to get to that. <laughs> uh, and, and this, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so, uh, and, and this is important because when it is coordinated, we need to defend not just the, the surface, the attack surface, mm. but also how this attack is portrayed on social media, uh, online, and mm. so on. So, this is essentially two fronts uh, at the same time. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the urgency is to build the internet, including the application label of the internet, like social media platforms and so on, in a way that is conductive to resilience, not disrupting the resilience. And this is what we have signed uh, on the Declaration for the Future of the Internet uh, this mm-hmm. April with more than 60 uh, partners now, all democracies, uh, to shape the internet in a pluralistic and inclusive way so that we can do collaborative diversity instead of just you know collaborative um, harmony, <laughs> like just one single uh, top-down, lockdown, takedown stuff, or um, diversity but doesn't collaborate, uh, polarization, hate, and so on. So we must uh, avoid falling into either spectrum end of the trap, but instead do collaborative diversity. But how do you collaborate with uh, this? Which, what kind of tools or frame? Yeah. So, for example, um, uh, France, of course, is a signatory of the DFI, uh, and so we can invest uh, into like the public code infrastructures. For example, Finland, Iceland, Estonia shares the X code infrastructure. So uh, their public service systems. Uh, if one suffers cyber attack, and in Estonia they do, right? Yeah. <laughs> if they suffer from cyber attack, learning and improving uh, its systems, um, Finland and Iceland automatically gets the benefits mm-hmm. uh, of the protections of the okay. improvements and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I think the underlying layer, um, if it's open source, if it's public like science, uh, mm-hmm. publicly published, uh, more and more democracy are now seeing it as a essential investment so that one country's penetration testers, red team hackers, and so on, can find vulnerabilities and fix it before the attackers do. Mm. So basically it means that uh, France will benefit from your experience Mm -hmm. in that way. Or uh, Estonia will benefit. Yeah, and and also we can contribute uh, to share the messages and the playbooks. Uh, I personally uh, contributed in uh, translating uh, the disinfo uh, dot, uh, the, I think it's a quite uh, uh foreign service um, measure uh, that uh, tries to uh, work with the um, large platforms to review whether it's actually working uh, for or against information uh, manipulation uh, at this info dot uh, and if you go to that website, uh, you will see um, actually my translation uh, on it. Uh, it's in uh, Mandarin. <laughs> in Taiwanese yeah. Mandarin. <laughs> in addition to Francais and, and English. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, so, so um, this uh, spreads the awareness of the French mm. playbook uh, to our population. Okay. Uh, just to me, well, you start to answer to this, but uh, what kind of antibodies Taiwan mm-hmm. uh, can rely on to mm-hmm. counter these attacts mm-hmm. coming? Uh, Mm-hmm. coming from abroad, as you say, that yeah. can be less vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, of course the idea is uh, f- to form a democracy network. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in our ministry in Moda, uh, we don't have a department of international cooperation. Mm-hmm. We have a department of democracy network. Uh, and so for the democracy network, um, we're a .tw, right, a top level domain. Uh, we can uh, donate uh, as open source, public code, and so on. Uh, Our efforts in, for example, working with the IPFS to safeguard our website, Mm -hmm. Uh, but our website also learns uh, from the design systems, from the architecture of the GDS uh, in the UK. Uh, And so if the GDS UK uh, does some secure components like uh, GDS notify to send secure emails and SMS uh, to notify people of possible problems or digital service, we can't adopt it without uh, a procurement Mm -hmm. because it's published to the internet and I will just take it and translate it. And similarly, if the UK or anyone wants to learn from our IPFS uh, in a couple months when we publish that into the public domain, they can then take it and use it. So the idea is a collaborative commons. Uh, that is the antibody that all the democracy can jointly invest in. Mm-hmm. But at the Taiwanese level, mm-hmm. what, what are the, the antibodies? I'm sorry? At the Taiwanese level, uh-huh. what, what are the, the antibodies to, to fight? To fight, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, we use the best of breed uh, okay. components okay. Uh, and in what we call a zero trust architecture mm-hmm. to safeguard against cyber attacks, one example. Uh, so when I was quarantined for um, seven days, um, immediately following the beginning of Moda in early uh, September because I was diagnosed with COVID, um, I didn't take any day off 
uh, I was able to sign uh, official documents on my phone uh, and do all the businesses. And that's because um, my phone checks for my fingerprint for the SIM card for a secure connection for the integrity of the FIDO uh, mechanism on, on my phone. Mm -hmm. And uh, if one of the three factors is penetrated, uh, still the attacker would not be able to gain uh, my authorization, mm -hmm. uh, but the system would detect it, uh, the intrusion, and uh, be able to be resilient against that sort of attack while the other two factors uh, take hold. This, virtually impossible to take uh, all three factors at the same time, especially because they're all by different vendors. So we intentionally work with a heterogeneity of vendors, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Microsoft, uh, with Amazon and Google, um, VMware, Cloudflare, you name it. Uh, and so to take over all these companies at the same time <laughs> is very difficult to say the least. Yeah. Uh well, you, you, you've been advocating for open source and yeah. transparency for a very long time. Um, but don't you think there is a, ri a big risk to mm -hmm. weaken, uh, uh, to weaken uh, your system if you open too much mm -hmm. and if you give information? You know, there is a possibility that you can give information mm -hmm. to your enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the Especially enemy, in this the, climate. Uh, yeah, the enemy already the knows the, the yeah. system anyway, right? Yeah. It's just mathematics. But if, uh, if you, the system is, is too much open, uh -huh. yeah. is it a weakness? No, it's not. Uh, and it's one of the oldest uh, laws, uh, well, principles, uh, axioms of cryptography. Uh, it's called Kirk, uh, Kirchhoff's law, Kirchhoff's principle. Uh, I think it dates back to the... Uh, 19th century, so a, a long time ago, uh, and uh, Klaus Shannon uh, rephrased it uh, to say the enemy uh, knows the system. Mm -hmm. So when designing crypto systems uh, against cyber attacks, only um, the, the key, uh, for example, my fingerprint, uh, the hash of my fingerprint anyway, uh, or the passphrase or whatever, uh, that is secret. But everything else um, is assumed that the enemy knows all about it. Uh, because if you don't, then you design crypto systems, um, cybersecurity systems, to protect a large um, material, right? a large amount of material. Mm -hmm. uh, but you defend it uh, just by safeguarding a key, just like a safe, right? Mm -hmm. But if now you must uh, defend, assuming the enemy knows nothing about the blueprint, about the design, about the system, and so on, then you end up defending a far larger material <laughs> than the material you're originally defending. Mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't make sense uh, in a cybersecurity context. Yeah. Uh, so all the good cybersecurity systems are designed uh, in the open, uh, with open mathematics. Uh, and in the end of the day, uh, just in the uh, Enigma uh, Bomber Colossus uh, story, um, 80 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, at the end of the day, um, it's also a competition of computation power. Um, if you have orders of magnitude of better computation power specifically designed for crypto systems, uh, you can use what we call brute force attack to simply just crack uh, the code. But fortunately, uh, the advanced semiconductors for such purposes is manufacturing in Taiwan. Yeah. So it's <laughs> difficult to imagine <laughs> that there are you know, 100 times more advanced uh, semiconductor chips somewhere that's not Taiwan. Mm. Um, you mentioned before that there is a, a possibility of an attack or mm. an earthquake mm -hmm. on, the, on the sea cables. Yeah. Um, what, what is the reality of this threat? Mm -hmm. Not only earthquake, but uh, to be There's cut. actual earthquakes. Uh, <laughs> that did, did, cut, did cut the cables. For example, there is this book, uh, 2034, uh -huh. which uh, yeah. one of the, the mm -hmm. parts of the books concerned an, an attack on, on the sea. I know, there's also books on you know, the Datun volcanoes. But <laughs> anyway. And uh, so, uh, what could be done to prevent uh -huh. this kind of, uh, yes, internet footage? Uh, yeah, yeah. Especially so, for nice. Yes. yes, so to, to go three dimensional, right? Mm. Uh, to look toward the sky. Uh, we need uh, to, right now, uh, prove that all our existing critical infrastructures and systems can survive the uh, extreme scenario of all our submarine cables being cut mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, and so for the next couple of years, we've allocated around 17 million euros uh, to build uh, more than 700 uh, stations, that's to say receivers, 
uh, for non-geostationary orbit satellites. Um, nowadays, we already have some capability. In the Xinju Fire Service, there's this firefighter's trunk uh, where they mount a mid-Earth uh, orbit receiver. Uh, it's actually a French uh, Luxembourgian uh, SES uh, okay. company. Uh, and so if there's fire that uh, destroys the telecommunication in a place, the firefighting truck can drive there, uh, connect to the satellite, and then share 5G signal uh, it's, to it's the nearby mobile, phones. It's a mobile, uh, it's a mobile tower. It's a mobile tower. Mm -hmm. And because it's modular, so you can change to different receivers. So if that doesn't connect to SES satellites <coughs> very well, um, it's possible to extend it without rebuilding the whole uh, design mm -hmm. uh, to also receive from low Earth uh, orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in this mobile design, whether it's mounted on a truck or a boat, I've heard on a kite, uh, or drone, or things like that, uh, that offers unprecedented flexibility mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you don't have to build it all around in a very dense fashion. You can just build in a few strategic points in a fixed way, and the other ones would be mobile. Uh, and so that's the thing we're going to test in the next couple of years. So you mentioned the town, if I'm correct, the, with the mm -hmm. fireman. Is it an experience, or mm -hmm. they already put in a? a yeah, reality, it's it's an experiment, but it's already built and tested. Okay. So uh, you can actually see the live video links. Okay. Uh, the bandwidth is actually pretty good, uh, 15 megabits per second. It's just because it's mid Earth, so it takes, I think, a fraction of a second, uh, a couple hundred millimeters for a round trip. Okay. <coughs> so there's a slightly delay uh, in the feed. But if it's low Earth orbit in the future, then that latency is even smaller. And it could be enough to prevent information, mm -hmm. to prevent to help the people mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. ground? And, uh, I mean, the, yeah. the system can... Yeah. can yeah. Right, so it's two parts, right? Mm -hmm. One is uh, the local zone of the public cloud providers. As I mentioned, uh, Google already, uh, Amazon as of last month, Microsoft pretty soon. Uh, they will be able to uh, do the computation entirely within the perimeters uh, of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all those critical services which used to send some of the computation to, I don't know, Japan or other places, we trust those places. We're not you know, restricting like data localization or anything like that. But when all the submarine cables are cut, uh, yeah. you cannot compute in Japan. <laughs> right? So, so two, difficult. right, difficult. Uh, so two phases. One is to uh, move uh, things to the local zone uh, of the public cloud providers. And the second is to then uh, maintain the broadband link over the satellite for the message we need to send outside, uh, like the journalistic reports. Mm. Uh, for this, this project, um, Ukrainian, if we come back to mm -hmm. the comparison always with oh, yeah. Ukraine. Ah. Uh, I've used Starlink uh, since mm -hmm. the beginning of uh, the war created by Elon Musk. Yeah, very, a, very famously. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it is an, also an option you're working on? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, mm -hmm. this project of Starlink, especially? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I think we've already opened uh, this possibility of uh, applying for the commercial operation mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, not just uh, stationary uh, orbit satellites mm -hmm. uh, to take care of the rural areas, remote islands, and so on, which is uh, separate from this all hazards resilience plan. Mm -hmm. There's this uh, commercial application. Okay. So the all hazards starts early next year, but the commercial operation application period is now already. Oh, it started. Uh, it is already started. Okay. Uh, and so I think the first batch uh, will close around end of this year. So we will see uh, how many providers uh, join uh, okay. in the commercial operation. So it is possible that the commercial operation can fund itself uh, for many of the remote areas and therefore uh, lessening the uh, need uh, to have the strategic deployment on the resilience parts uh, in those very remote islands and things like that. Mm -hmm. Or on the, I think they are now also offering um, uh, boats, uh, like yachts, uh, and also airplanes uh, also. And that's also very good uh, because it works in conjunction right, with this uh, all hazards plan. So this is government funded. And this, if they apply, will be funded by the commercial uh, actors. So there is a possibility that uh, Starlink and Elon mm -hmm. Musk could join the, the competition. Yeah, so, so all the you know uh, non geostationary satellite providers, and there's more and more every every month, right, in the LEO space. Uh, but did you did you look uh, 
look at the situation in Ukraine particularly? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, of course we're in contact with like-minded democratic partners uh, in various levels and uh, we learn also from their experience, uh, for example, the DIA uh, application. So it's not just the link, but also the application, people's familiarity yeah. with an app and so on. So it's this all-stack approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. What, what, what lesson did you learn, uh -huh. uh, concretely speaking, yeah. from, uh, from Ukraine? Right, so two things. Um, first, uh, the importance of heterogeneity, uh, like not putting the egg in the same basket, uh, meaning <laughs> that we want to, as I mentioned, uh, work with as many public cloud providers as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the adjacent layers, uh, we insist on interoperability, so that even if one vendor uh, fails for some reason, uh, we can, <laughs> we can uh, plug and play uh, other vendors uh, without uh, disruption of the service. Mm -hmm. And that requires, uh, of course, additional investment. Mm -hmm. Because if you just do a you know, lowest uh, cost win uh, bid, uh, then of course one single vendor uh, with the economic of scale can take over all the uh, tenders. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. uh, we want uh, multiple vendors on each possible layer of the service. And so even if one fails, the other can take uh, effect immediately. Just to be dependent only on the one provider. Exactly. Yeah. And it was, um, so you mentioned two lessons. From yes, the, so this is yeah. the first one? No, the, the, <laughs> that, that was two lessons, okay. right? So one is on the local zone, okay, the public sorry. cloud, mm -hmm. not to over rely on just one public cloud okay. provider. And the second for connectivity, okay. not to rely on one single provider for connectivity. So one is compute, one is connect. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, for Ukraine again, let's see if we stay a bit in Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, was it something very important to, mm -hmm. to get the, the Stalin system? I think it's important uh, for the uh, Taiwanese people mm -hmm. to see uh, that this sort of uh, high band with low latency mm -hmm. uh, is important to keep the information flowing uh, in a all hazards scenario. Um, truth to be told, Although the NDC, Microsoft, Pegatron, with in uh, Xinzhou City fire fighting project is very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, probably only people in Xinzhou and uh, some people who are into this sort of thing knows about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but after the uh, Russia's brutal war of aggression against Ukraine, everybody knows about satellites. Mm -hmm. So, right, so uh, just uh, from the very uh, societal resilience point of view, and also convincing the parliament that we need a budget mm -hmm. <laughs> to deploy this. Uh, this is important that the Ukrainian experience show the importance mm -hmm. of connectivity um, against all hazards uh, to the people in Taiwan. This is the recent experience for Ukraine, but in 2017, mm -hmm. uh, so years before invasion, five years before invasion, uh, Ukraine's mm -hmm. already experienced uh, mm -hmm. cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, in your point of view, aware of that. Yeah. why she, they didn't urge, why they didn't act so more quickly to mm -hmm. prevent this kind of uh, attack? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think um, not just Ukraine, right? Uh, around the same time frame, uh, we are also seeing the, you know, the the Tallinn uh, playbook, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Estonia, Estonia also uh, suffered. Um, so I, I think this is uh, not isolated. Uh, to any particular jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, this is basically once there is a systemic vulnerability, uh, for example, an over-reliance uh, on a single point of failure, the lack of multiple factors, uh, mm -hmm. and so uh, makes it very uh, attractive. Uh, and they may not be um, just uh, military um, uh, incentives. There's also ransomware uh, incentives, many other incentives. Um, so these are kind of the, I would say they are symptoms uh, of a fragile uh, cybersecurity design. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, um, symptoms uh, that we see uh, around the world uh, tells us that we need to not just counter each and every cyber attack attempt, mm -hmm. but to revamp our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Just like revamping our urban planning to be resilient against earthquakes. It's not just uh, one building down, rebuild it, one building down, rebuild it. We need to uh, enhance and refactor the buildings even before the next earthquake comes. That's the main lesson we learned. Um, with the TSMC, you mentioned before, uh, the mm -hmm. fact that Taiwan is a good expertise on this. Mm -hmm. uh, is, well, Taiwan is the leading country for uh, chips and semiconductors. Mm -hmm. uh, this expertise and the, this Taiwanese over dominance in, in this sector uh, prevent you from an attack? I mean, um, is it something that uh, mm -hmm. maybe they will think two times before uh, launching mm -hmm. something? 
Well, of course, we occupy a central position uh, in the global supply chain. Mm. Uh, and uh, when uh, the chip were in very, very high demand, especially during the pandemic, uh, when people switched to telecommunication uh, in their work and education, uh, we made every effort uh, to increase the output uh, shipments and so on. Uh, and so I think the true shield, uh, so-called silicon shield, is the amount of trust that our democratic partners place on the quality and security of Taiwanese chips, mm. because that powers not just academic research, right, but many other things <laughs> as well. And so you have to probably trust TSMC and the Taiwanese cybersecurity industry that protects the TSMC supply chain uh, to place uh, so much of your computation uh, in the design and the manufacturing of the Taiwanese uh, chips. Mm. So much so that uh, we say MIT made in Taiwan, mm. but T uh, now to me also stands for trustworthiness. And I think that trust is the true shield. Mm. This is a brand, basically. Mm. Exactly. It's not only TSMC. It's exactly. A... It's the entire cybersecurity around TSMC. Mm. Uh, well, we, we talk about before, but maybe, maybe we can come back on this issue. Mm. Do you think Taiwanese people are enough uh, aware and prepared in this uh, mm -hmm. cyber security climate, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, cyber mm -hmm. threats coming from the broader? Yeah, sufficiently aware, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sufficiently prepared. There can never be sufficient uh, preparation. Uh, I think one of the main idea uh, is to continuously improve our defensive capabilities by fostering our local red teams. Red teams in cybersecurity mm -hmm. are people who think like malicious actors. The only difference is that they tell you when they find something wrong <laughs> with their system. Mm -hmm. uh, so they are also very creative. Uh, and we work with the white hat hackers uh, as penetration testers, as red team, and so on, with our blue team, which is the joint defense system. Uh, all the publicly listed companies in Taiwan uh, over the next couple of years need to join this uh, blue team together. This is uh, not the case right uh, now. Right now, it is for the uh, critical infrastructures mm -hmm. uh, and the public listed companies that deliver the service to a lot of people, like majority of population and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think uh, within a year, uh, any public listed companies that's not reporting a heavy loss uh, we'll have to join uh, because it's um, somewhat expensive, you see. <laughs> but but uh, then the next year, even the companies reporting a loss uh, below one EPS uh, must also join. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, of course, it's uh, rolled out in steps. Uh, but at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is everybody is part of the blue team. And the blue team need to sufficiently fund the red team to attack the blue team systems okay. and share what they have learned and improve together. It's called purple teaming, uh, red plus blue purple teaming. Yeah. What could you say to the French uh, public, the French maybe authorities mm -hmm. would try to get mm -hmm. a, a more uh, active, proactive action in this uh, cyber uh, field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, early next year uh, in January, we will establish the National Institute of Cybersecurity, or NICE. And in addition uh, to the talents development and so on, uh, one of NICE's main uh, principal component is to engage uh, in uh, DARPA-like uh, joint research programs mm -hmm. with the leading uh, crypto analysis, cryptography uh, communities, uh, post-quantum and things like that, communities, to see if there are parts of the research that can be turned into the uh, practical cyber attack and defense uh, mechanisms within the next four years. Mm -hmm. And so in this, we are not alone. Uh, and there's very similar interest all around the world in not just safeguarding against uh, the kind of uh, human-made earthquakes, but also uh, the uh, possibility of re-identifying private information, uh, profiling people, selling them advertisements, and so on, which is not uh, malicious in the same way, but uh, also quite malicious uh, for the so-called dark patterns uh, and things like that. And so for scams and building addictions and so on. And uh, the latest trend uh, is to invest in the cryptography so that when, for example, France and Taiwan jointly train an AI system, we don't need to look into any raw data, personal data of each other's um, health records or financial records or things like that. So computation over encrypted data, uh, this is a new field of research. 
Uh, and so in doing so, we don't have to then share the raw data to the trusted parties in the enclave, uh, which creates um, attractive targets for a cyber attack, um, mm -hmm. right? So uh, joint research into such what we call privacy enhancing technologies or PETS, mm -hmm. that is something I'm sure that because of the Data Governance Act, the Digital Resilience Act in the EU, uh, everyone in the EU uh, and the UK, uh, we need to say that now, <laughs> is <laughs> looking into, paying attention to. So in that, we can join uh, the nice and similar institutes uh, in the democratic countries in such kind of research. But would you say the, the democracies have uh, underestimated, mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the, the threat, the level of the threat, mm -hmm. the danger around the the mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I would say that um, people put a lot of attention on the, the damage uh, prevention, mitigation, and things like that, but not enough uh, attention uh, on how citizens, regular citizens, can participate mm -hmm. into the joint defense. Uh, it's like um, every country has epidemiology experts, professional institutes, that research cure and vaccine and things like that. But sometimes it takes everyone uh, to wash their hands thoroughly uh, with soap. Uh, but that actually is a difference between the initial uh, successful defense. Uh, so there is strength in plurality. There is strength in societal resilience. And that is the main message uh, that we want to get across, is digital resilience uh, for all people, with all people. But we. We, we are lacking this kind of experience in, in Europe, for example. Uh, is it something that uh, we need to, to work on? And mm -hmm. in what way mm -hmm. you can convince people to join? Mm -hmm. And how do you do practically? Well, speaking? for example, uh, it's about shifting the societal norms, right? Uh, you say you, you don't have such a norm, but I, I wouldn't uh, think uh, necessarily that's the case. Uh, one example, uh, many people are now insisting on using end-to-end -end encrypted instant message systems. Mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago, not the case. 10 years ago, people think more connection better. Uh, it's fine if the messaging platforms have a copy of my materials. They cannot uh, see anything interesting anyway. But turns out that's very interesting <laughs> for the advertisers and dark patterns and uh, you know, cyber attacks and ransomware. So, so um, nowadays, people are insisting that when I send an instant message to you, uh, it must be only visible to both of us and not anyone in the middle. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but that was not the norm years ago. So uh, the insistence on building better um, hygiene, cyber hygiene of norms can start from a personal data protection perspective, privacy perspective, um, citizen control perspective, and so on. And but this is a tool. Yeah. It's not, yeah. you, you're not asking people to do something. You just yeah. give them a tool to make better Right, right. So, so the next privacy. step, for example, uh, nobody wants to remember uh, 10,000 passwords. But on the other hand, uh, those 10,000 different services, if you use the same password, uh, that's very attractive for cyber attackers and they gain all the passwords. Uh, but having to receive an SMS uh, every time you type a password, uh, very inconvenient, right? So when we say uh, zero trust architecture, we say, oh, it's actually very easy. Uh, you just don't use passwords. Uh, instead, you use the same phone, uh, installing the same authenticator and use your fingerprint, but the fingerprint is only on your phone, not transmit anywhere else. Uh, for many people, they buy it not because it's more secure, but it's more convenient mm -hmm. uh, than receiving SMS or typing passwords. Mm -hmm. uh, and so building good habits that are also convenient, that is going to be the, uh, our call uh, in the nice, in the mode, in many places, so that we can transform uh, the societal resilience without any top-down coercive approach but simply because uh, people prefer it this way. Yes, but uh, uh, what I meant is the, the participation of the people in yeah. a way that, uh, as you have in, in Taiwan, yeah. the civic hacker, these yeah. kind of things, how can you mm -hmm. uh, convince people to come to act and yeah. to be one part of the global yes. system? Yes. So again, uh, if uh, the people uh, in some places in the EU uh, doesn't think a cyber attack is the number one threat, uh, maybe they can uh, feel that uh, online hate or polarization uh, is a number one threat, mm -hmm. right? But because resilience is all hazards, 
the defense against one hazard is also good to defend against the other. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you do not face the same, um, because your country uh, is not in the tectonic plate, so <laughs> the earthquake warning level uh, probably not the same. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, right? If you care about um, stopping the online polarization and hate without compromising your freedom of speech, chances are you're going to invest in the same, uh, just like this info that Quedo was saying, right? The same um, safeguards against information manipulation, the citizen participation, collaborative fact-checking, journalism, and um, digital competence, media competence, and so on. So uh, I'm not saying that everyone needs to assess cybersecurity as a top priority. Mm -hmm. It's just if the resilience against, say, polarization and online hate can be shared with the world, then we can see the synergies between one defense here and one defense there, and then join each other in the digital resilience. Last question concerning mm. uh, something very personal. What, okay. uh, what, uh, what would you do after the, well, next year is the national election, presidential election. Yeah. What is the, your plan? Do you have to think about the future? Um, I will probably still work here uh, as a minister because it's a few months uh, after the election and the transition of the government. So <laughs> that's an easy answer. <laughs> uh, I think um, two things. Uh, one is that I want to make sure uh, that I'm working with the people. So um, if you go to our website, you can see our monthly ministerial uh, ministry meeting mm -hmm. uh, with all the departments and uh, administrations uh, reporting on what they have done, planning for next month, and so. And it's radically transparent. It's mm -hmm. in the commons. Uh, it's in the public domain, uh, as is the code for our website and so on. So I would uh, strive uh, to whomever uh, is taking the Ministry of Digital Affairs uh, to work with that team mm -hmm. to ensure that this culture of radical transparency of security through openness, not through obscurity, uh, is continued uh, in the culture of Moda. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that I will also continue to work with the democracy network. Um, okay. in, right, so, so I'm working, of course, with the Taiwanese people, but at the same time, I'm also working in like eight different international NGOs. Uh, to share this model with the other parts of the world that want to learn from the Taiwanese experience and vice versa. So if I spend less time in Taiwan, I will spend more time uh, for France, maybe. <laughs> uh, right, right. So because we're all in it together, it is truly a global emerging threat to the digital resilience, the very foundation of the internet, the continued existence of internet as a trustworthy place, which is under severe attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and so any corner of the world, we can work together. So you have a lot of, do, a lot of things to yes. do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your time. Great questions. Thank you.